every Tuesday for six months straight, I did the exact same workout. And when I was tracking the trends on that workout, one week it would be four sets of 10 second sprints. The next week it would be 37 sets and then it would be 11 sets and it would be 20 sets. So if you write this down on paper, you're like, it looks like a five-year-old constructed this training program because there's literally no directionality in it. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one fitness and performance resource in Switzerland. On today's episode, I'm happy to interview Evan Pycon. Evan is a coach, a translational sports scientist, and an educator at the training think tank HQ in Atlanta, Georgia. Evan is also a former track and field athlete and has learned from world leading experts in applied muscle physiology and performance. His goal is to identify learning factors in sports performance and develop methods to break through those barriers. And he has experience working with athletes on site and remotely across the US and internationally. Evan, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. First of all, can you please define for me translation of sports scientist, what it means to you? Yeah, of course. So I always get this question, translational science, in essence, you could be a translational sports scientist, there's translational medicine. Basically what translational science aims to do is take findings from fundamental research and turn those into applied practice. So if we think about the primarily two different ways that we could try and understand the human body, we have what we could call like a top-down approach. So if we're talking about sports science, studying the body from a top-down approach would primarily be through the lens of physiology. So we're trying to understand the body as a system of systems or on an organism level. On the other hand, we could take what's called a bottoms-up approach. So this is looking at the body from the level of genes, proteins, lipids, more of a molecular biology approach. What translational science aims to do is kind of take the middle ground. So we could pull from applied practice and then try and work backwards and understand mechanisms for why these things that we're observing, these big picture phenomenon are happening. Or we could start from the ground up, understand how systems work at their most basic level, and then try and work backward from there to understanding how um, patterns or behaviors arise on the system level. So my goal for this, uh, this podcast is to try and get your perspective on a lot of of topics that uh, have kind of their old version and you have uh, some really interesting updating ver updated versions uh, of those. So to start it off, can we talk a little bit about uh, training research and how most of what we find in textbooks, uh, thinking back of, for example, uh, uh, is it science and practice of, uh, of strength trainings as your ski and, and other texts will reference uh, stress physiology models. And uh, it, it turns out that maybe it doesn't work exactly like it says in those books still today. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the stress physiology one is a really interesting example. Um, when I first became interested in training research, the same thing, I read all of the classic textbooks. You got your super training, you have your science and practice of strength and conditioning, all of these uh, famous books. And in every single one, you see the same chart of general adaptation syndrome, and they talk about Hans Seiley. And everyone kind of has that same stance and you just assume, oh, this, this is obviously how the body adapts to training because it's in every textbook I've ever read. And a few years back, I found a paper by John Kiley and it was the first time that I really saw a very contradictory view to how most people approach it. And John Kiley's a sports scientist as well. And after reading his work, I started looking into a little bit more where these stress physiology theories came from. And when you look into the field of stress physiology, what you see is back in the 1930s or 40s or 50s, Hans Seil's views were very well respected. Everyone understood general adaptation syndrome is the way that our bodies adapt to stressors. But in about the 1970s, the field of stress physiology started to throw those concepts out the window. Like any scientific field, you take the old principles, you refresh them, you take what's useful and you keep it, you discard what's useless. And by the 1980s, stress physiologists had a completely different view of how we adapt to stress than what we were doing in the 1950s. But for whatever reason, general adaptation syndrome was cemented in the training world in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And despite the fact that no one in the stress physiology world still holds those views, everyone still recycles those same concepts in the training world. So now we're at a point where you buy a new training book, they're still talking about general adaptation syndrome and all of these 
uh, classic terms or these what they call fundamentals, but then you look at the field of stress physiology and you look at the field of molecular adaptation and none of the things they used to say are accurate. So we have that super compensation concept that they always talk about where you impose a stressor and you see a decrease in performance or a decrease in function of some kind of system. Then this time course runs and we super compensate and then we get stronger, more enduring as a result. And that's like baked into the notion of training. We always talk about, oh, you don't get stronger while you're working out. You get stronger after you recover. We super compensate. But then you look at the literature and specifically you look at like the signal transduction literature in genetics or in molecular bio. And what you see is that, oh, there's, there's really no need for a super compensatory time course. Like you could adapt to a stimulus without ever having that refractory period or without ever having a decrease in performance. So it doesn't mean super compensation doesn't exist. That time course does occur in some systems, but it's not a principle of adaptation. It's not required. There's other time courses of adaptation. There's other ways that we could adapt. And I think by broadening our scope, it actually opens us up to a lot more training concepts that we could take in because if we're only seeing the world through that traditional lens, um, it's almost like if you only speak, I know you're multilingual, aren't you? Yeah, two. Okay, two, and two languages. <laughs> and um, I know I'm not, are the structure of those languages, like the grammatical structure, the syntax similar? Or do they have kind of different structures? It's fairly similar with French and English, but okay. I think of German, which I don't speak fluently, uh, but that's that's quite different. And obviously, there's other languages that have much more different structures. Right. Than, you know. Yeah. So let's say, like, I only, I only speak English and I speak a little bit of Greek, and it's not great, but I only speak English. So the way that I see the world is constrained by the language I speak because it has a certain grammatical structure and a certain syntax structure. If I learn how to speak German and I learn how to speak Mandarin, they have completely different grammatical structures, ways of structuring sentences, and that opens me up to other ways of thinking. So I might think in ways that I couldn't otherwise. And the same thing when we think about training, if we only speak this language of supercompensation and this is a fundamental view in our minds, it constrains our creativity when we're thinking about new training paradigms, where if we open our minds up and we could speak these other languages, you can speak supercompensation, you can speak signal transduction hypothesis, you have more creative options for how you could um, imagine training to be. And so to put that into context for people, can you talk about the training and kind of the one, end of one experiment that you did when you were training for that 500 uh, rowing uh, distance? And and, yeah, so. and and then sorry, more precisely, the the differences in, in in training sessions that you did throughout the course of that of that training, and how different those were depending on day to day, and with no further explica- explanation, essentially. Yeah, so I come from a 800 meter running background. So if you look at how people train for the 800 and how they would train for the 500, they're they're decently similar events. So when I decided that I was going to spend almost a year training for the 500, I thought like fuck it, I'm going to try something I've never done before. So almost every single one of my training sessions over that year were guided by near-infrared spectroscopy or MOXIE monitor, practically speaking. So what I did is I knew on any given day, I had no perception of what my sets, reps, total time I was going to be training were. I would just go into the gym and I would have a specific physiological reaction that I want to get. So if on Tuesday I knew my goal is to get mitochondrial biogenesis, Um, and I'm going to be doing some kind of repeated sprint protocols, I would put a moxie monitor on my leg, which would allow me to monitor um, changes in blood flow and muscle oxygen saturation or the amount of oxygen in my muscles in live time. And I would get on the bike and I would hold a fixed wattage and I would sprint till I pulled all the oxygen out of my muscle. Then I would recover until oxygen rebounded in the muscle. And I would just repeat that until I got some kind of compensation happening inside of the muscles that would tell me that I'm no longer getting this training response. And I repeated a lot of sessions. One of the things that I've talked about before is every Tuesday for six months straight, I did the exact same workout. And when I was tracking the trends on that workout, one week it would be four sets of 10 second sprints. The next week it would be 37 sets and then it would be 11 sets and it would be 20 sets. So if you write this down on paper, 
you're like, it looks like a five-year-old constructed this training program because there's literally no directionality in it. But I was looking at long-term trends in these numbers because when we're changing our training view from this classic um, coach's model, like you have your sets, your reps, and you're controlling things on paper, that control on paper with these rigid progressions is kind of an illusion. It makes us think that we're controlling something that's nice when we're telling our athletes, you're doing two more sets than you did last week. But the way that I view training is anything that we're doing, the ultimate goal is to manipulate physiology. So if we're instead working at the level of physiology and all I care about is getting specific reactions inside of the muscle and specific reactions within the body, I don't really care what my sets and reps and all these things look like. So what you end up with is this training program that looks incredibly chaotic. But what ended up happening is over that six month to a year period, I was doing like a very high percentage of training volume at what would be race speed for a 500 meter. And I had a training distribution that allowed me to leverage frequency and build up very big amounts of volume without getting a lot of um, stress on my body like I felt fine I was doing a ton of what people would call anaerobic work but it allowed me to perform in a way that I don't think I would have performed otherwise if I was using more of a classic training approach with more of a normal distribution of training so before we jump into that kind of updated model with the, the limiters and, and other things that you've kind of come to, to realize and found over time can you let's go back to the, the kind of the original the block periodization where it came from and and what it actually means in, 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 in training. Yes, yeah, so if we look back at where block periodization comes from, a lot of it was actually from, um, it came from like Lenin, like in Soviet Russia, when they had these economic planning cycles. So they needed to fit things into like quarterly cycles, yearly cycles, four year cycles. And what they ended up doing is they took these economic planning cycles and they just superimposed them over training because it makes sense if you have this ideology and it's supposed to apply to economics, it's supposed to apply to us, um, all these different things. Well, why not just layer that over our training year as well? So they ended up training these very discrete blocks. And another reason why they were doing it in Soviet Russia, they noticed every winter their athletes' performance would tank. So people would just feel like complete crap every winter. So they would build that into the year, their yearly planning cycle. In the winter, we're going to do lower volumes, lower intensities, and that allows our athletes to handle training better people in the West ended up um, copying those principles. But what they didn't know is the reason why the Soviet athletes were doing that is because they were all vitamin D deficient in the winter because they lived in Russia and there's very little sunlight and it's very cold. And what the Soviet sports scientists found is that when they start using UV lamps in their training halls in the winter, they no longer needed to use that block style of periodization. So it's another case where a solution to a very specific problem arises and people copy that solution without really knowing the context. And then the people that originally came up with that solution, they're no longer doing it because they don't have the same context and they understand that context, but everyone else is still copying it. It's like the QWERTY keyboard that we're using. Like you look down, we have this layout on our keyboard and everyone thinks that our keyboards are laid out like this because oh, it has to be a really efficient way to type this is actually the least efficient possible combination of keys on a keyboard. And the reason that they did this is that when they invented typewriters, if you type too fast, you would jam your keys on the typewriter. So in order to make it so people aren't just jamming their keys and breaking their typewriters, they worked meticulously to figure out the least efficient way that you could possibly type. And thus they created the QWERTY keyboard. Today, we're all still using it even though we don't even have mechanical keyboards, these are digital keyboards, but we're all still typing QWERTY and no one really questions this assumption because if this was created at some point, it has to make sense, even though it really doesn't make sense anymore. Same thing with that block style of periodization. It was created at a time when it made sense. It no longer makes sense, but people are still using it because they don't know the history behind how it came about in the first place. Is there still some contexts where a block periodization would make sense? Yeah, I think for, I think a lot of it would be practical for the most part. So generally, like if you're working with like a high school athlete where their years are broken up in very specific quadrants, like it could make sense or even beginner and office athletes, I think there's a good reason to use block periodization with them just because it will probably allow for better volume accumulation and skill retention. 
but I think when we're working with late stage intermediates to advanced athletes or elite athletes, I think we start to get into the realm where that type of approach is very underwhelming relative to what they could be doing. And so uh, when you talk about more advanced athletes in that context, would you more go more towards an undulating type of periodization method or can you talk about what you would use in, in those contexts? Yes, I think undulating periodization would be a really big step in the right direction. Um, I might even take it further and use more of like an emphasis, de-emphasis style training program. I think the most comparable style of training would probably be something like vertical integration where at all times of the year we're touching on all of the qualities that are relevant for that athlete's sport and just kind of changing the frequency and distribution of each. So it's almost like an equalizer on a stereo. If we have like treble, bass, volume, I don't know what all the knobs on a stereo are. I'm talking out of my ass right now. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of them. So whatever they are, like all of them are going to be on at all times. So we'll turn one up and then we'll have to turn the other one down. And it's kind of like training. If we reduce training down, let's say we have an athlete and the only things that they care about are aerobic base work, aerobic power work, and speed work. It's like the simplest example we can make just to make it nice and reductive. A block style approach, they would spend a bunch of months doing that aerobic base work, then move on to that aerobic power work, and then move on to that speed work. And they would hope to have residuals from each training phase and end up in a better place where they started. But I think an alternative approach would be during that aerobic base work, what if we made 50% of the training volume aerobic base work, 25% aerobic power, and 25% speed? And then in the next block, when we're emphasizing aerobic power, maybe that's 50% of our volume, aerobic base work is 25 and speed is 25. And we could go through cycles like that. So we're always either building something up or maintaining it. And that allows us to like cement adaptations. So over longer time frames, we're able to build up more things and maintain more adaptations with less detraining. I think if we project out two to three years, athletes actually end up in a better place using that kind of approach than they do using a block style approach, which might manifest better results in like a six month to one year time frame. But for most athletes, we're trying to project out long term and we want results for as many years as possible. So you touched a little bit on uh, aerobic capacity, aerobic power. Can you talk to us about how you view energy system training and uh, together with strength training because one could argue that they're kind of one and the same we just we've made that that separation at some point because it's probably easier for us to understand but so how do you how do you view those kind of separate blocks that seemingly work together yes yeah, so tackling the energy system first um, a lot of people are familiar with like a zone model of energy system training maybe like a three zone model or a five zone or seven zone model there's all different iterations and the basic concept of zone models are at each progressive zone, you are increasing intensity. And the way that I view energy systems isn't fundamentally different, but instead of a zone-based model, it's a spectrum-based model. So on one side of the spectrum, we are primarily delivering oxygen, and on the opposite side of the spectrum, we're utilizing oxygen. So what we would actually see, if I pop a MOXIE monitor on someone's quad and we're observing muscle oxygen saturation at live time, let's say we get you and you hop on an assault bike, and you're spinning nice and easy at maybe about 150 watts, you're gonna be building up a reservoir of oxygen in your muscle, so you're over delivering oxygen and you start ramping up the intensity a little bit and you're gonna deliver it a little bit slower over eight. We keep increasing your intensity, maybe you're at like 325, 350 watts now, and now you're at the point where you're delivering and utilizing an equal amount of oxygen in the muscle. So the amount of O2 is just gonna stay stable, and then we start pushing your intensity and now you're utilizing more oxygen than you're delivering and you start pulling oxygen out of the muscle at a very rapid rate until you're moving at a max intensity and you are utilizing far more oxygen than you're delivering. So the way that I would view training is on one side of that spectrum, we would call it delivery or oxygenating work. You were delivering more O2 than you're utilizing. On the other side, we would call that utilization or deoxygenating training. Then anything in between that is gonna be a spectrum where that ties into strength training is it's not that different. When we're doing strength training, if you're working at very low percentages of your one rep max, this varies person to person, but let's say a population level average between about zero to 30%, you'll be creating what's called compression reactions in the muscle. So you're basically creating these light contractions where you're squeezing a little bit out of the 
a little bit of blood out of the muscle every time you contract and then you relax and blood comes back into the muscle and now we start contracting a little harder and you're going to get what's called the venous occlusion reaction for most people this is about 30 to 70 percent of someone's one rep max when you get venous occlusion arterial blood is still entering the muscle but venous blood isn't leaving so when people talk about getting a pump that's a venous occlusion. You're allowing all this blood to come into the muscle, but it's not escaping. You're getting this nice swelling effect. And then you keep increasing intensity and eventually you'll cut off blood to the artery, which means no blood is entering the muscle, no blood's leaving the muscle. So on surface value, you're like, okay, the spectrum of oxygen delivery to utilization, I get that, that relates to energy system training, the spectrum of intensity of work inside the muscle during strength training it makes sense but how do we combine these things together well the way that these relate is that our bodies only speak the language of tension and energetics so my brain doesn't care whether i'm doing a set of front squats at 70 percent of my one rep max and i'm getting that venous occlusion in my quads or it doesn't care if I'm rowing at 70% of my max top speed and I'm also cutting off blood flow and getting that venous occlusion in my quads. So for any activity that I'm doing, there's gonna be a given level of tension and a given level of oxygen utilization in the muscle. So knowing that, we could kind of start to collapse the boundaries between strength and energy system training and see, oh, when I'm doing a set of front squats and I'm sprinting or I'm sprinting on the rower, if they're about equal levels of tension in the muscle and they're equal levels of oxygen desaturation, my brain's going to see those as the same thing. Our brain's not distinguishing between them because we are getting the same signals happening in the muscle and our sensor proteins are detecting the same changes in calcium ions or glycogen or force or hormones. And then we're getting the same signal transduction process. And then we're gonna get the same like effector processes that are regulate gene transcription. And ultimately that's what's gonna dictate our adaptation to exercise. And so how do you, so how do you blend those uh, into a training program, having that kind of new perspective on things? How how does it work? Do you still you still qualify it as as one or the other, or in your in your mind and on paper, is, is it not that anymore? Yes. Yeah, so I take a very um like physiology minded view when I'm looking at training. So even if I'm writing strength training into a session, I'm always thinking about okay, I know what this is doing on the level of tension, but like what is this doing on an energetic level? When I'm doing this hypertrophy training, I'm desaturating the muscle and I'm creating hypoxia. So if I was planning on doing resistance training, then maybe doing some like threshold rowing repeats, I can't see those as two compartmentalized things. I think the classic mistake that I made and a lot of other people made in the CrossFit world is we would take these successful programs from the strength training world. Like we would take like a small of squat cycle or Wendler's five through one or West side. And then we would find like a Jack Daniels running program. And we're like, this works in isolation. This works in isolation. I'm going to smash those together and what everyone found out when they did that is like three weeks later you feel awful like it just doesn't work and intuitively you're like okay it makes sense that this wouldn't work because both of these programs were written assuming there's a given amount of stress and recovery but one of the other reasons why it doesn't work is that because those programs are fundamentally acting on the same systems so the way that i think about training is like we have adaptation currency and where are we spending this money strength training is pulling from the same budget as energy system training so i'm always thinking about what is the physiological reaction that's occurring with the strength training what is the physiological reaction with this energy system training if we know what we're trying to get from each we could better manage our budget and then we could figure out how to lay out a training day a training week two training weeks a cycle and we could build those off of each other a little bit easier and so I guess you mentioned it a few times, working with the, the testing te testing technology, the, the Moxie, uh, amongst others. Can you talk a little bit about that technology and how it's it's changed your perspective on, on training? Yeah, so anyone that's used the Moxie, one of the first things that you notice when you put it on is everyone does the same test. You pop it on your muscle, and then you just hop on a salt bike or you just haul ass for 30 seconds and you see what's going to happen. And the second you do that, the first thing you see is oxygen starts depleting rapidly. And the second oxygen bottoms out or hits 0%, you're screwed. Like, you just fall off the rower. You can't possibly improve performance. And the best you could do is hang on. And coming from um, 
more of like an academic science background. I, I was very familiar with bioenergetics and particularly a lot of those classic models. And I'm like, well, how does this make sense? I was taught that when I'm doing an activity like zero to two seconds, you're primarily using ATP stores and two seconds to 10 seconds, like this is immediate energy sources. I should primarily be using phosphagens and the oxidative system shouldn't even be contributing to work until two minutes in. Yet the second I start sprinting, what do we see? Oxygen starts going down rapidly. So I'm like, this makes no sense. Like this monitor is like fucking broken. This thing doesn't work. And then inevitably, like after you get pissed off and you decide that this thing's a piece of shit, a few days later, you come back around. You're like, I'm going to try and understand why this hap- why this is happening. And you start to find research that's contradicting those class models, much like that um, path dependence example at the QWERTY keyboard. Same thing happens in energy system training. The classic energy system training models that most of us are familiar with from either like an ex-phys background or reading super training or coaching manuals that was created before we could practically measure most of the energetic processes that are happening in the muscle but now we have all these technologies we have near infrared spectroscopy which allows us to measure oxygen being utilized in live time we have nuclear magnetic resonance which literally allows people to measure pcr being used on the level of milliseconds and these technologies didn't exist when we came up with the models but when we take into account these newer technologies and the research being done with them it fundamentally changes the science of bioenergetics and how most coaches would look at it. And Moxie was my introduction to that. And now five years later, it's it's completely changed how I see training in every single way. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. I've, I've heard you talk a bunch about, about limiters. Uh, so how do those play into your, your model uh, in training? And uh, can you talk a little bit about each one of them and how you might see them uh, kind of uh, uh, show up in training on, on, on any given day or any, you know, any given workout and how we react to it. Yes, yeah, so previously I would classify limiters in more of like that traditional energy system based model. Like this person is very enduring and they have a very powerful oxidative system or we would say like this person is very powerful, like their ATP PCR system is like off the charts. But knowing what I know now, which is that these processes aren't uncoupled on the range of seconds to minutes to hours. Like all these processes are occurring within like a hundred milliseconds. So we can't uncouple these different processes from each other. Like all training's aerobic, all training's lactic, like everything is everything. So we've had to move away from trying to classify things with this bottom down approach. And instead we could look at the body as a system of systems. So the analogy that I always use is a car factory. Since I know nothing about cars, what, Whatsoever. I talk about like a hot wheel factory instead because it's a little bit simpler and I could comprehend it. So if we have a hot wheel factory and let's say we have like a conveyor belt line and we have three steps on this conveyor belt process. We'll put the wheels on these hot wheels cars. We'll put the paint or the wrap on them and then we'll box them up. And these are the only three steps. So let's say putting them in the boxes at the end, that's the slowest step in this factory line. And if we want to make like a fat stack of cash and get more of these hot wheels out the door, we need to figure out where the rate limiting step is. So if we decide, okay, we're going to double the amount of machines that are putting wheels on these hot wheels cars. And then we check back a week later and we're like, we're not making any more hot wheels cars than we are before, because that's not the rate limiting step. The rate limiting step was boxing these cars up. So instead what we did is we just have a bigger pile of cars waiting to get boxed up and none are getting out of the factory quicker. So a better approach would be, okay, let's find the rate limiter in this factory process, boxing up those cars, and we'll double the amount of machines there. And now we're getting more of those cars out the door quicker. We could look at the body in the same way. When we're doing maximal effort exercise, there's thousands and thousands of processes that are occurring simultaneously, but there's actually a very small amount that are going to end up being limiting factors for performance. If we're talking about energy system-based events, those are primarily going to be the respiratory system, which is going to function to get oxygen into the body and get CO2 out of the body. We have the delivery or cardiac system. So after oxygen comes into the lungs and diffuses into the blood of the alveoli, the heart's responsible for getting that oxygenated blood to the working muscle. And then we have the what we call like muscular oxidative capacity, but in practical terms, oxygen util- utilization. 
So these are the three main limiters that we see. So if an athlete's limited by their respiratory system, the way that we would see this on a moxie trends would be that if we're doing like a step test, we'll see they're progressively getting less and less oxygen into the working muscles. So we know, oh, this is an oxygen supply issue. And the other thing that we'll see is they're progressively getting more and more blood driven into the muscle when it's not under tension. If we think about what the respiratory system does, it gets O2 in. So if it's coming to a point of failure, we see less oxygen, but it also is meant to get CO2 out. And if we're not getting enough CO2 out, CO2 is a vasodilator. So we open up those capillary beds and all those blood's going to start from the muscle. And we'll also see if we're measuring it with a different device that these athletes' brains aren't getting as much oxygen while they're doing these tests. If someone's limited by their delivery system or their heart, we'll also see they're not getting enough oxygen into the muscle but we'll see completely different blood flow trends. So we'll generally see these athletes are clamping down on the muscle and they're creating a lot of vasoconstriction. See so these athletes get a lot of occlusion and they're cutting off blood flow a lot. Then we could also see that someone's limited by oxygen utilization, which means they're getting enough oxygen into the muscle, but they're just not utilizing it. The way that I usually think of that one, it's like, let's say I give you a debit card and I'm like, hey, there's $100,000 on this debit card. And this is the only money that you have for the next year. Buy all your food with this. Like you could buy a ton of food, but I forget to give you the pin number to this debit card and you end up starving to death. And from the outside, people would be like, wow, like he had hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend on food, but like he starved, like it doesn't make sense. And it's like, well, that's because you couldn't utilize the money you had. It's the same thing with the utilization limitation. They have plenty of oxygen in the muscle. They just can't utilize it. So they end up failing, even though it's like, dude, the food's there. Just use your pin number and unlock it. So I've moved away from seeing limitations in this like pathway dependent view to more of these systems that could be limiting performance. Are those limiters exercise uh, specific or movement specific or pattern specific? Or do you find them, it's just say an athlete is, uh, their, their main limiter is, is the respiratory system, for example. Um, do you see that in every exercise and in every test, or does that kind of depend? Yeah, that's a really great question. So to add a little bit more nuance, so I would think of limitations in three different ways. We have event-specific limitations, energetic limitations, and then, for lack of a better term, what we call like our global compensation pattern. So on an event specific limitation, let's say I'm a respiratory limited athlete. If I go do an 100 meter sprint, I'm not going to be limited by my respiratory system because that event selects for rate of oxygen utilization. So I'm probably going to be limited by utilization there. Similarly, I could take a utilization limited athlete, but if I have them go and run an ultra marathon, they're probably not going to be limited by oxygen utilization on that event because the utilization demands are going to be so low. Then we have our energetic limitation, which is the three that we were just talking about. And then where the model really comes to fruition is what we call the global adaptation trend. So this is the set of compensation patterns that someone's body undergoes by virtue of their limitation mixed with the type of training that they're doing. So for example, if you're a delivery limited athlete and your primary training sport is CrossFit, so you're doing CrossFit four or five, six days a week, when CrossFit athletes are delivery limited, they get a very specific set of compensation patterns. For these athletes, one of their biggest issues is that their cardiac output is very weak compared to the amount of tension they could create in their muscle. So what this ends up creating is a scenario where these athletes are always cutting off blood flow to the working muscle while they're doing CrossFit. So for them, a CrossFit Metcon is kind of like doing VFR work. I'm sure you've seen some of those athletes that do CrossFit where like they just get super yoked doing CrossFit and like they don't even do hypertrophy training. They're like, yo, this guy's doing burpees and wall balls five days a week, but he has an FFMI of like 24. And that's because that's a compensation pattern that occurs. Like there's nothing fundamental about being delivery limited that makes someone jacked. But when you're delivery limited and your sport is such that you're doing very high reps of movements, alternating body parts, it's going to make you more prone to hypertrophy. So I'm always thinking about training in those different ways. Like how are you limited on this specific event? What is your primary or energetic limiter? And then what compensation patterns are you creating through like environmental stressors? And then that's going to dictate like how you regulate adaptation as an individual. And so by using those, uh, you talked about auto-regulated protocols 
using the Moxie as kind of a, a, a direct feedback mechanism to, to kind of tailor your sessions. Uh, so how does how does that work in regards to to, vol to training volume? Do you with that technique are you able to to limit kind of excess training volume that you would otherwise if you just plan you know I, I'm doing ten sets or twenty sets or thirty sets and are you able to reach that kind of minimum effective dose for for adaptation or is it somewhere in the middle with the moxie at that, at that point? Yes, yeah, so I think it, it's going to depend on what kind of training adaptation we're going for. So if we start like with something simple like strength work. Um, I know, or let's say hypertrophy training in particular. So I know if I want to get hypertrophy, I need to create mechanical tension in the muscle, like period. There's no other way about it, whether or not we're using metabolic stress to drive mechanical tension or more traditional methods, like that's what we're looking for. So if that's the case, if I'm doing a bicep hypertrophy session, it's a nice, simple, easy muscle. What I would do is I'll put the moxie on my bicep and I'll rep out a set of curls to failure. And what I'll see if I'm using enough weight is that I'm either going to get that venous or arterial occlusion response in the muscle, which tells me I'm creating tension where I want to be creating tension. And I'll also see oxygen being utilized in that muscle. So what I could then do is I'll rest, I'll let blood, uh, blood flow in that muscle stabilize, I'll let oxygen saturation stabilize, and then I do it again. And I keep doing it again and again and again. And eventually what I'll see is I'm either not creating tension in that muscle, so we'll see a different blood flow trend, or we'll see that I'm not utilizing oxygen in that muscle. And there's reasons that either of those could happen. One could be acute muscle damage. So if we're creating excess muscle damage, our brain's gonna sub-recruit that muscle. And if we see a sub-recruitment pattern, it shows we're not creating tension where we used to be creating tension, or we're not utilizing oxygen there anymore. Our brain will create compensation patterns. So I still might be completing my set of curls and getting a similar amount of reps, but if we are mapping out, we might see all oh, my anterior delts taking on more loading when I'm doing this bicep curl or I'm compensating using another muscle. Or it could be due to peripheral muscle fatigue, which is just, oh, I'm getting a decrease in signal to that muscle, so I'm not getting as much activation in that muscle. So when we're doing a hypertrophy training, really that's what we're concerned with. Like most of the hypertrophy volume meta-analysis is show in a single workout, you could do anywhere between maybe six, six and 14 sets for one muscle group before that volume is no longer productive. But when we look at that literature, it's like, man, that's a giant range, <laughs> like six to 14 sets, that's double the volume. And one of the things that we could do with the Moxie monitor is target that on a specific day. Like if optimal amount of volume is a movement window, I think that gives us a very meaningful proxy to understanding how much volume that muscle's handling on a day. And then we could use that to figure out frequency and how much volume you could do in a week. That being said, it's not a perfect technology. I think we could add a lot of um, clarity by combining like Moxie and EMG or Moxie and infrared thermography. And it kind of fleshes out the details, but as a standalone technology, it provides us a good amount of answers, but it also gives us, um, better questions to ask. And I think the process of asking those better questions is where the magic happens in like the sports performance world, like not making assumptions and you see something that's kind of weird that you might not expect in the muscle and it causes you to generate a hypothesis. Then you test that and you test it again and then you start to get a more clear understanding of how these process of regulating volume and adaptation are all working uh, within the body. Yeah, I want, to, I want to stay on the isolation piece. You talked about bicep and hypertrophy, hypertrophy work. Um, can you talk a little bit about the muscle isolation perspective versus kind of whole body unit and looking at muscle function in the way that you, that you plan and prescribe exercises so that maybe we don't get that uh, reduced range of motion due to kind of uh, systemic tightness in the muscle from training certain patterns a certain way? Yeah, for sure. So... Well, one of the things that I'm always trying to keep in mind, because I think what I'm about to say is probably going to sound like I'm like creating double speak. Like I'm going to say two things that you're like, well, how do these statements agree with each other? So to start, hypertrophy is entirely a local muscle intrinsic process. So before I talked about that like signal transduction hypothesis idea, and it's the same thing with hypertrophy. Like individual cells contain like the requisite subcellular machinery to sense and adapt to changes in their local environment. And this is illustrated with resistance training. If I'm doing bicep curls, only my biceps are gonna grow from doing that. Like it's not this global adaptation. I know back in the day, people used to talk about like, oh, if you wanna grow your biceps, like put 20 pounds on your squat. Like, it's like, how, how does that make sense? And there's this hormone hypothesis idea, like 
like T Nation would be like, oh, if you do deadlifts or heavy squats, like it increases your growth hormone and your whole body will hypertrophy. Absolute like bullshit. It, it's hypertrophy is entirely a local muscle process. So we always need to keep that in mind. But just because hypertrophy is a local muscle process does not mean that muscles don't impact each other. And intuitive, we all, we all know this, like someone could have muscle imbalances. We understand the like tensegrity model. So how strain in one area of the body could be felt in other areas of the body. So the way that I think about it, this idea that we, we only have one muscle, but we have 600 or so different fascial pockets. These are all of those different muscle insertions. So if I'm doing a ton of bicep curls, only my biceps are gonna grow. But if I'm creating excess tension in that muscle, it doesn't mean strain won't be felt somewhere else in my body. It's that idea, you, know, you do a ton of bench press, your pecs and your triceps grow, but you also get forward rounded shoulders because you're pulling more on one side. So knowing this, um, we could kind of, I think most people in the hypertrophy world have moved away from body part splits, but I still, still think there's some value to be had there. Like if we look at the different uh, fascial trains within the body, we could potentially create training splits around those. So we know, okay, the pecs basically wrap around the body, their fascial train, and they cross over the thoracolumbar junction. The hip flexors do the same thing in the opposite direction, crossing over the thoracolumbar junction. I can't speak. And one of the things that you see is, particularly in a lot of CrossFitters, they do a ton of work that makes their hip flexors very tight, but most CrossFitters haven't mastered the bench press shape. They don't really do much horizontal pressing. And if you look at like, even like a games level male, most of them have very developed traps, delts, biceps, triceps, lats, but they have very little pec development because they're not really doing that train when they are bench pressing. It's like all tricep. So a lot of them end up with lower back injuries because of their hip flexors and their pecs are both leveraging on that thoracolumbar junction. It's like a seesaw. You're putting a really heavy kid on one side of the seesaw and you're putting like this kid that weighs 30 pounds on the other side and it's gonna completely get imbalanced. So what you end up seeing for a lot of these guys with back injuries, it seems super contradictory, but you start increasing their bench press volume or you give them pec flies and you're doing things to create more tension in the upper chest and in the pecs and strengthen those muscles. And it starts to even out that seesaw. It's like you're feeding that really light kid that's suspended in the air on the seesaw and eventually it starts leveling out. So even though hypertrophy is like a local muscle process, I think we could approach it that way, bottoms up, but also take it from a top-down process. Like how do these different muscles impact each other? And could we create trading splits that allow us to keep growing those localized muscles without getting these like patterns of tightness and compensation? And I think the best bodybuilders do that. Like everyone says like oh, a bodybuilder, like they can't touch their toes. And it's like, you see IFBB pros doing full splits. And clearly they're not creating this excess tension muscle groups, but you see others that like can't lift up their arms like five inches. So I think there's something to be said about looking at hypertrophy training through both of those lenses and trying to come at a middle ground. Um, I've got a couple, the couple nice questions are more uh, on the part that's outside of the training per se. And so I wanted your take on those. The first one is uh, the idea of, either to get better at a, at a certain event or sport, uh, especially in the context of, let's say, advanced athlete that, that do a lot of volume to begin with. Uh, what's the drawback of doing more volume versus maybe adjusting some biological, psychological, social factors uh, to improve our training rather than just doing more training? Yes, yeah, so I think it would be hard to argue that like the total quality and quantity of training, like sport specific training that someone does, like that's going to be huge for their performance. But the issue is one, there's a point that doing more, it's not going to be more beneficial. And two, there's all these prerequisites that need to be met to do that. So I think one of the things you see is a lot of elite athletes, they keep piling on volume and they do get better, but then you see them getting broken like a year later. And I think that's because they're not addressing all these other factors. So rather than looking at training through like you do training and you get better standpoints, more of a biopsychosocial view. So we have the biological factors and the physiology. We also have the psychology and we have the sociology or social factors. And all of those are going to amalgamate to dictate how we adapt to training. So for that elite athlete who's only thinking about their training, they're not thinking about all these other things, they're leaving something on the board. Because even though training is like 
the field that we're playing on, it's built on a basis of like biochemical, psychological factors. So I think if we take that more multifaceted approach, we could potentially get better training outcomes with less total work, or at the very least allow athletes to handle those higher training loads without running into as many injuries long-term. I'm talk about injuries leading into the next question. Can you talk about the importance of the, the self-concept in athletes, especially people that train a lot, and what uh, an injury might do to them if, if they're kind of, their whole world is training and they are training? Can you talk a little bit about that since you have a lot of experience with, with some elite athletes? Yes, yeah, so that's one thing. It's like most elite athletes, that, that becomes their entire identity. And, you know, if they're making their money off of that, I don't know if I could argue that that's a bad thing, but it certainly has its downsides. I know for myself, when I was competing in track and field, that was kind of my life for a period. And when I got injured, like, talk about, like, the depression, anxiety that gets created by that, because your entire life is this one thing. Like, I would have identified I am an 800-meter runner. Like, if you ask me, what do you do? And when that gets taken away from you, it's like, what am I now? Like, I was an 800-meter runner, and, like, I just don't have an identity outside of that. And I'm sure it's similar people who are very invested in their jobs, maybe someone, um, a um, day trader, and then the market goes bust and they lose their job. And they're like, what am I now? So I think there's something to having a little bit more of like a multifaceted personality where just because someone's an athlete and training is extremely important to them and it might pay their bills, it might feed their family, but it doesn't mean that they can't be other things. So one of the concepts that I talk to a lot of my athletes about particularly the ones that don't make their living off of competing is that training can't be their entire life. Like if you're a CrossFitter and all you think about is CrossFit, like that is a recipe for disaster. As soon as the smallest thing goes wrong, like how you talk about not hitting a snatch PR in training. I have athletes that like, don't like they literally would go insane. They would go home and they would have like anxiety about it and they can't sleep and then they'll go fight with their partner because they're pissed because they didn't get their snatch PR or you get injured and it sends them like spiraling out where like, Oh, I got injured today. So I'm going to go home and punish myself with more training because like, this is my identity. So I think the more we can move away with that and understand like, yeah, training is really important to you, but what are all the other things that are important to you? oh, there are other things, like you have a job, you have a family, like you have a dog that you like hanging out with. And it's like, well, why not incorporate those into your identity? Like, yes, you're an athlete, but you're also a father. You're also a brother. You're also someone who likes reading. You're also someone who likes eating burritos. Like, why not build a personality around all these things? So you're less fragile when one of those things is taken away from you, which inevitably is going to happen for every athlete. You'll either get injured, sick, or you're just going to age and you're not going to be able to do your sport as well as you could. Um, Evan, it's been absolutely great talking to you. For all the coaches that are and athletes that are interested in learning more about what you do and all the education material you're putting out, and if I'm not mistaken, you're also uh, offering now mentoring for coaches. Uh, so where can people go to find more about what you guys do at Training Think Tank and more specifically what you do in terms of mentoring? Yes, yeah, so for Training Think Tank, Tank, either checking them out on Instagram, which is just at training think tank or training think tank.com. And then for my things personally, um, the main place to find me would be I put out all of my content for free on Instagram at Evan underscore P I K O N. I also do mentorship outside of that. So my mentorship program is based around taking sports science principles and applying those to training for athletes. So it's a mixture of physiology and understanding some of these contemporary views of bioenergetics and muscle physiology, using technology like Moxie Omega Wave Thermography, then a lot of practical training takeaways that people could use, um, whether or not they actually use those technologies in their practice. Well, so much. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Evan, today. It was great talking to you, and I hope that people get a kind of a broad perspective on how the body works and how to train it uh, in future days, months, and years. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It was great getting to talk to you, and I'd love to uh, chat again offline sometime. That'd be great. Take care.